Hello everyone. I'll just wait for a few people to join. Hi. So I'm not used to doing lives uh, normally for English channels. I normally do them for um, Indian based companies. So this is all quite new for me. So um, yeah, thank you so much Morley for inviting me to do a live session. Hello. <laughs> so when I was thinking about what to what we can do a live session on, I thought um, it would be nice to do something a little different. So let me introduce myself first. Uh, my name's Naina and uh, I work as an Ayurvedic practitioner. So my journey started about mm, 2016 and um, I enrolled on a course learning about Ayurveda with Dr. Deepika at Ayurvedic Institute UK. Uh, so my background's a pharmacist. So I came from the pharmacy world of dealing with healthcare and I noticed the gap missing in people's healing and much of it is spiritually related and more holistically related to do with the mind. Um, and then so my journey took me into the path of the Vedic sciences like yoga and Ayurveda. So I kind of embarked on this big transformational journey um, for myself, I think. I wanted to know what this life was about and finding happiness from within and harmonizing my life and my health, um, as well as helping people because I saw when I was dealing out all these medicines on prescriptions, I was like, this isn't right. Why, why are we on so much medication all the time? And you know, what's happening here? So that's how my journey with Ayurveda um, kind of came about and that's a little bit about my background. Uh, so right now I'm practicing as a practitioner, doing consultations and making videos as well. So I'm kind of growing the, the movement. I do a lot of educational stuff in teaching as well because I do tend to have a way of explaining Ayurveda quite interestingly. Um, I like to make it quite relatable because I think the science can be quite uh, can be quite challenging to understand. Um, hi, Patricia. <laughs> it can be really challenging to understand, and so I think making it really relatable and understandable for everybody is the key. Um, we are in a time in generally, I think, in this era, um, even more specifically now with the coronavirus, we're in a time where we are looking at ourselves a little bit more closely and asking ourselves, what is the nature of all of this? What am I doing with my life? And am I healthy? You know, there's a virus around and, and am I healthy? So I would like to talk today about a chapter or not a chapter, a few verses within a certain chapter in a classical Ayurvedic text. So for those that don't learn Ayurveda, um, it's a very ancient medical system and it was first documented in writing about 5,000 years ago. So even before that, it's even older than that. So can you imagine? Uh, one of the great texts that the science has written down in is called the Ashtanga Hridayam. So I've got a specific copy here. So um, Vedic scriptures always have commentaries on them. So depending on the person doing the commentary will depend on the kind of essence of what they've extracted from that scripture. Um, so I'm a particular fan of this copy of the Ashtanga Hridayam because um, it was gifted to me and recommended to me by one of the doctors at Govardhan Eco Village in India. I went there for a month long treatment and uh, I became very good friends with the doctor there. He still teaches me now. Um, and he gave me this copy of the Ashtanga Hridayam is commentary by the man that opened Govardhan Ayurveda. So it's an Ayurveda center in India. And uh, this is the man on the back. Unfortunately, he's passed away now, so it's really sad, but he's done a beautiful commentary on this text. So anybody studying Ayurveda that's watching this, I really recommend this um, commentary. It's just absolutely fascinating. One of the things he says at the beginning when, when you're deciphering Ayurveda and any spiritual text 
is to look beyond and behind what the scripture is actually saying. So even though it may say something in word, look behind, like what's the energy behind it? What's the essence? What's the juice of it? Because we can all look at, um, so one of my teachers actually said this the other day, you can have a piece of fruit like a lemon and you can see that as your, gosh, I don't hear this horrible noises outside my window. Um, you can see a scripture like a piece of fruit. So for example, a lemon or an orange. But actually there's an essence inside, which is the juice. And it's only when we cut it open and we can extract that juice that we get to taste the actual item that we're, we're embarking on. And scripture is a bit like that. And he really advises in this copy of the Ashtanga Here They Am to, to go beyond the scripture. So we're gonna do a little bit of that today. Um, so as people are following Morley, um, probably very interested in Ayurvedic lifestyle. So looking after yourself through beauty, through ritual, through daily routine. This is such a lovely way to enter into Ayurveda. Um, it was not the only route that I entered into Ayurveda. Mine came from a more medical aspect. But when I started doing the daily routine, it just transformed my life. And um, I'm so thankful for the oils and the herbs and the products that Ayurveda can provide us with to restore balance to ourself and, and also to help us find ourself within that. I think that's the beautiful part. So speaking of daily routine, there's chapter two of, I might have to shut my window soon. <laughs> this is real, I hope you guys can't hear this horrible noise outside my window. Um, within chapter two, Yay, I made to change my life. That's really good, Eleanor. I'm so glad. I, do you know what? I also love hearing people's stories of how I made to change their life. I'm like, yeah, tell me what happened. And, you know, like to see people light up in that way, I think it's, it's really beautiful. Um, so in chapter two of Ashtanga Hridayam, which I've got in my hand here, it outlines the daily routine. So if you've read this, you'll see that it's a lot to do with cleansing scraping the tongue, doing the abhyanga oil massage, waking up early, exercising, nasal drops, all these sorts of things. There is chapters and verse, sorry, there are verses within this chapter that talk about how to, uh, how can I say, I've, it's, it's been called code of conduct, but it's not actually called such code of conduct, it's more of a way to organize yourself and your thoughts, things to avoid, things to, to go for, the sorts of people to surround yourself with, the sorts of people to stay away from, to avoid, situations to avoid, how to speak, um, how to go out at night, being safe, all sorts of things. So we're gonna go through a few of what these things say and I feel actually it's as important to recognize what these are as your daily routine. So, just as we might scrape our tongue every morning, we might clean out the toxins that are inside our body. If the toxins within our mind are not being cleansed, if they're not regularly being addressed and we're not looking at ourselves internally, then this whole process is going to be much more inhibited. Okay, I think I might have to shut my window there, so bear with me, because it's a little bit loud. Okay, sorry about that, <laughs> it's so loud outside my window. Sorry, someone asked if I could repeat the title of the book. I'll hold it up for you. Ashtanga Hrid Dayam. It's one of the great trios of Ayurvedic text. And it's chapter two that has this something called the Dinacharya, which is the Ayurvedic daily routine. And I was just saying that most of it's about, there's a big part at the beginning that's about cleansing, but there's a lot about how to manage yourself and how to conduct yourself. And I feel that this plays just as an important role in doing our outward activity and cleansing. So the mind is incredibly important 
in your health in an Ayurveda says this um, oh. <laughs> Uh, so Ayurveda says this, yoga is all about balancing the mind. Even in this classical text, what the great rishis would say about Ayurveda and health is that when the mind is balanced, it's, it's able to conduct the body in a more healthy way. So when you manage your mind, your health is automatically already so much more in balance. So looking after your mind is just as important as um, doing a daily routine. And I think this is so important because what it allows us to do is to do our daily routine, do our tongue scraping, do the oiling, but doing it with awareness from a balanced mental state. Because any outward action always has something behind it. There's always an energy behind it. If you're rubbing oil on your body because you feel insecure, if you feel worried about something, or you know, you're doing it for a reason behind, it's not going to be as effective. You've got to oil your body with love and balance and do it in a relaxed way. And that's the energy behind the action. And I feel the things that listed in this part of the chapter that we're just gonna go through get to that a little bit you know it's kind of saying it's teaching us how to to manage our life so that our mind is able to be more balanced it builds awareness of what we're doing and then therefore whenever we perform our rituals whenever we do anything ayurvedic or not whatever we do we have that awareness behind it and it makes us into more conscious beings. So just after, let's begin, I'll begin working through it. So it talks about the bathing part at the beginning and then we get to um, I'll start with verse Sutra 2.21 to 22a. Um, sorry, someone's just said something. My acupuncturist says my body has not caught up with my mind, but my mind is fully ready. Any advice? Uh, I would say that, okay, you've got to, you've got to harmonize the body and the mind. You know, the best way, my advice, the way to do this is through pranayam, breathing exercises, because the breathing is so related to our physical body whereas our prana is related to our mind. So the union of the breath and the mind, and the, sorry, the breath and the prana moving together in pranayama practices is a way for them to, to, I wouldn't say catch up with each other, but like one's moving super fast, the other one's moving maybe in accordance to that and they're not in harmony together. There's not a balance. So when you do pranayama exercises, you can bring the two together. And as you breathe, you're connecting with your flow of prana and you respect that flow of prana as well. So that might be a good way to balance the mind and the body connection. I'm a massive fan of pranayama practices. I feel like they're going to make a huge difference to us, especially with this day and age with a respiratory virus <laughs> going around. So I hope that answered your question. And I'm gonna go back to the talk here. So the first sutra that starts to talk about how we should conduct ourselves and how we should behave. Occupation, friends and others. So without going too much into the translation and the commentary, um, one must serve benevolent or virtuous friends with sincerity and keep a distance from others. So what this is essentially saying, and you can break it down, there's other words and, and Sanskrit words in there, and it's talking about um, happiness and dharma and, and about in terms of who you surround yourself with in order to fulfill that. It's, it's saying to serve friends that are sincere and keep a distance from others. So 
I think in a way this this is kind of telling us to um, just to be aware of who you surround yourself with and this is a common tip they give in these kind of new spiritual development new age lines of thinking is you know you are who you surround yourself with and it's so true if you surround yourself with people that are not on that journey in the same way you are it doesn't mean to say that each any journey is bad or good or faster than another or higher or lower it's just a different path and if you surround yourself with people that aren't on the similar path you're going to hold yourself back on your own spiritual journey which means you will not be able to fulfill your dharma as much as you can in this lifetime so that's something to think about um thinking about who you surround yourself with and then it says 10 things to strictly avoid so it's called 10 sins so the 10 sins to avoid um, and the so let me just give you a little glimpse of what these things look like in the text just because it's so interesting so they have the Sanskrit as you can see there and then they have the um, the verses and all the translation it's so fascinating so the 10 sins to strictly avoid one should physically mentally and verbally give up the 10 following sinful activities so are we ready Violence, that's pretty obvious. This is Ashtanga Hridayam. Uh, Mal V just asked which book it is. Uh, violence, theft, infertility, defamation, rude behaviour, lying or cheating, useless talk, interrupting others <laughs> while they're talking. Oh my gosh, I, I sometimes do that. Uh, evil intentions to harm someone. Desire for other be others' belongings, so jealousy, and ignoring someone in an insulting manner. Now, we could look at these and think, yeah, I'm never violent. I don't steal. I haven't cheated on anyone. I'm never rude. Um, I don't lie. I don't cheat. I only talk when when's needed. But actually, each of these words have different dimensions. It's not just what you do outwardly. It's also how you treat yourself inwardly. And this is where it gets really interesting. So if we look at each of those, so this book goes through each one quite in depth in a spiritual kind of perspective. So himsa is the word for violence in Sanskrit. And obviously we shouldn't be violent to anybody, but we also shouldn't be violent to ourselves as well and this is something that we need to watch out for especially if your constitution is, has a lot of fire and heat you can have a tendency to be pretty hard on yourself internally um, the commentary on this has said himsa so violence on a spiritual level means to obstruct the spiritual progress of another living entity by thought word or action so that's the interesting part of um, violence on a spiritual level so not to obstruct someone from pursuing a path that they wish to take stare is the word of thieving or stealing and uh, in the Gita um, there's a definition of the of a thief and it also teaches us that everything in the creation belongs to and is supplied by the supreme lord to to not acknowledge that and enjoy everything claiming them to be one's own is called staya mentality on a spiritual level and i think this is very interesting with the day and age that we're living in because when we have a stealing mentality we tend to feel that everything is for ourself um like the the plants and everything is there for our taking almost and it, it, you know you do anything to make yourself bigger to to make yourself succeed 
and without even thinking, does this actually belong to me? Does this, does this earth, does these resources that I'm using to make money, they don't actually belong to you to do that. And it's, it's very nice to give respect to working with natural things. Like this book is written for Vedyas, which is the word for Ayurvedic doctors. So Ayurvedic doctors should not utilize the medical profession as a means to extract unfair amounts of money from clients. So the Vedyas were taught to respect that the herbs they're using, the knowledge that they're using with patients is not necessarily theirs. Like to label it as their own is not, it's, it's almost a stealing mentality. And you've always got to humble yourself before the supreme consciousness when you're dealing with these, the dissemination of this knowledge too. So I'll move on to the next one now, which is lust. Um, it's another way of lust. So infidelity. So if there's a lot of lust and desire in the body, this is something that we want to avoid. And it's a sin that they've said to avoid this. So managing desire is to do with managing the mind and the senses. It's a long journey that we've all got to take eventually. Um, so it's, it's teaching us to avoid moving into our desires and our lusts a little bit too much. Um, envy, so we shouldn't, we shouldn't be envious of other people. And um, this is something that happens to all of us is that we might look and think, oh, you know, you, you desire to have that thing. And I think managing this is uh, a good way to do it. It's just to cut yourself off from things that trigger it. It doesn't mean you don't like that person. It doesn't mean that you're gonna throw hate at them, but for your own peace of mind, don't surround yourself with things that make you feel less than you are. Don't surround yourself with images of things that you think, oh, you know, I want that. Rather find it, see it as an inspiration and a tool to be able to become the best version of yourself, not to become them essentially because who you are is so valuable like it's so special who you are and so don't look outside of yourself this constant external looking we we i was taught it about it a lot in my yoga training in india you know when you're practicing yoga in, in a group you don't look to see what other people are doing it doesn't matter it does you no favors to spread your energy and look to someone else you just focus on yourself that's it and if you have to close yourself off from things that make you look out, look too outwardly, then, then do it. And you have every right to do that. You have every right to protect and preserve the peace of your mind and the state of your mind. Um, the next one talks about not being rude to other people. This is something that you know, we've we've all we've all made these mistakes. We've all we've all been in situations where we think, oh God, I shouldn't have I shouldn't have spoken like that. Um, but it's something to be aware that it agitates the mind. So when you know that it agitates the mind and you feel yourself brewing up with internal anger to, for the rudeness to come out, you can try to catch it and uh, make sure that you don't allow it to happen because all day it'll be replaying in your head like. Oh, but they did wrong to me. I should have. I should have said something. And you'll try to justify it. And it all makes the mind move. So if you've noticed all of these things that I'm saying that that are written in the text to avoid, they're all things that agitate the mind. And when the mind is agitated, the body cannot be healthy. So that's why these things are written in the scriptures so that our mind can become balanced, which helps our health enormously. Uh, then he talks about trust, um, and then he talks about not to accumulate more than necessary, so don't become greedy with your belongings and your money. Um, don't want to harm anybody, don't desire other people's things. There's a lovely quote by Gandhi. He said, the world has enough for everyone's need, but not enough for even a single person's greed. 
which is really lovely. I love Gandhi's words. Avoid people that don't make eye contact. So I'm all going to look, make eye contact with everybody now watching this. Um, it says to, to be careful of those that don't, that are not able to look you in the eye. That's something to think about uh, when, you're, when you're dealing with things. Um, so try to avoid maybe going into big decisions with people that are not able to look you straight in the eye. Uh, what else? And at the end he's nice, he said, it is only out of ignorance that one commits these sinful activities. Even if one has knowingly or unknowingly committed these sins in the past, now is the time to repent and take firm resolve to avoid them in the future. So just having an awareness of these things to avoid in our life, even though we might think, oh God, I did that, I do it a lot. Um, having an awareness on it will allow us to take power of our own journey back again. Uh, and then later on, the next verse talks about, it's not sufficient just to avoid sinful activities. One must also help those that are in need. So now it moves on to service and how service to others is required in order for health to be there because it keeps the mind um, healthy. And uh, this particular commentary of the Ashtanga Hridayam is, I believe, written by a Krishna devotee. So therefore, he does reference the Gita a lot um, and his take on Dharma so there's many perspectives on what Dharma is. If you ever research the word Dharma, there's so many different ways to understand it. His perspective on Dharma in this particular text is saying um, it's all about service. It's all about helping others. This is the ultimate Dharma. To be able to see another, another's need and be at their service is every human's ultimate Dharma. And then the next verse talks about seven kinds of people to be worshipped. I don't think we've got time to go into too many of them, but it's, it's an interesting one. Um, Worshipping cows, learned scholars, elderly people, um, guests. Uh, and he talks about that. And then it talks about... So I've, I have tabbed some interesting ones. The, an interesting sutra after that is the art of speaking. So I spoke about this with my students recently on my online classes. I've seen a couple of them come online. So hello <laughs> to you. Um, it's lovely to see you here. Uh, so the art of speaking is a really interesting aspect of the text that they talk about. So making sure that your speech is relevant to the context and time. Precise and to the point not contradicting yourself, being soft, speaking pleasantly with a smile, favourable, well-mannered, compassionate, gentle, not confiding everything and not being suspicious of everyone. So what this, what this sutra is essentially teaching us is to just think before we speak. Is it helpful? Is it kind? Is it compassionate? Is it necessary? So even in the previous verses, it says, don't talk unnecessarily, don't talk nonsense, don't um, interrupt people because you need to say your bit. Um, so think before you speak. And this touches on what I mentioned at the beginning. I feel that behind every action, including the words that you speak, there is an energy and there's a force behind it. And it doesn't matter what you say sometimes, you can say two words, but if they're said in a loving way with a really beautiful, pure energy behind it, the whole universe can be understood in those two words. And sometimes you're so close to someone, they don't even have to say anything and they can feel everything. So that's the beauty of the art of speech is that we are able to control what we say to people and make sure that the energy behind it matches what you're saying. Uh, there's not a mismatch of energy where you're saying something but behind it you don't really mean it. You don't really want to be saying it. It's not truthful from your heart. So the art of speech is to be able to conduct 
yourself and your speech in a way that's honest and truthful. And if you can hold this honesty and truth throughout your day and commit to it, just like you might commit to your daily routine of doing all the rituals, then you are placing yourself in very good stead for a balanced mind and a much easier day, a lovely day to have, to know that you've been so truthful and, and, and you've spoken appropriately. It also mentions in here that you shouldn't confide everything to everybody. You don't need to tell people about your misfortunes. You don't need to talk badly about authorities, disrespecting them, complaining. These, all of these words are an energy. They're sending out vibes and you should avoid doing this if you want to keep your mind steady and your body healthy. It talks about four things that should be concealed. So things that you shouldn't show people. Don't reveal enmity toward anybody. Don't reveal, uh, so don't reveal when someone's been hostile to you. Um, oh, thank you everyone. Oh, someone's put my link to my classes there. Oh, that's good. <laughs> yeah, come and join my classes. This is the sort of thing that we talk about. Uh, it's really good. And um, don't reveal, don't talk about experiences of insult. So this is so interesting. I definitely went for a phase where I went round my friend's house. This is like way, way back at the beginning of my journey when I started to be like, hang on a minute, am I really doing what I want? Um, and we'd go, we'd go round there and we'd sit and gossip. We'd talk about other people and I'd end up saying things that, um, I'd go home and be like, reeling in my head like should I have said that oh my god how does it make me look da, 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 you know it just disturbed my mind so much and looking back on it I just thought this is not good this is not good if I want to progress on my spiritual journey if I really want to be the best version of myself I have to break away from these types of groups and this type of talking and um we've all we've all gone through it like sometimes we do get a little bit catty uh, we need to have a bit of a vent and a moan, um, which is understandable, but just be cautious and be aware of how much you're doing it and how much is affecting you. I'm going to keep an eye on the time because sometimes I'm a little miss chatty. Good, still got half an hour. I think it's an hour on here, isn't it, we can have. Um, and then the next chapter we start to talk about, sorry, not chapter, I keep saying chapter, it's verse, it's sutra. We're still on chapter two. Um, oh, this is lovely. I just want to say this about speech. Um, do not reveal what you have thought of doing. Keep it a closely guarded secret. Being determined to carry it out to execution. I love this. I absolutely love this because I think our ideas are so precious to us. They're like little baby plants, like little sprouts, like when their seeds have just started sprouting and that little thing is just popping out. You don't want to push it out into the light, into the daylight where there's frost and, you know, it's, it's really harsh conditions. You want to nurture it and keep the idea, water it, nurture it, let it grow. Not everybody needs to see it yet. And then when it's nice and strong, then you can take it outside and plant it into the soil with everything else and it will flourish because it's got that strength from where it came from. You know, that strength at the beginning, that security. It's almost a bit like our children having that beginning nourishment and, you know, they're not put out into the big wild world just yet. They need to be nourished and have a secure base from within. And our, our ideas are just like that. Our ideas are like God's children, you could see it. Um, I use the word God quite quite easily there, but if you have another word for it, it's absolutely fine. Um, but yeah, this is how precious our ideas are. They are like the Creator's children, and we should nurture them and look after them. And it's all about energy. Like you keep that energy, keep it concentrated inside and let it grow. And just be careful about how much you speak of things. Even when you're doing self-development and you're healing yourself, you don't need to tell everybody exactly what happened with everything that you're eating, everything you're doing. 
Like You don't need to relay it to everybody. Keep it for yourself, let it ruminate, let it digest within you and let the process happen within you. You don't need to share it all the time with everybody. Instagram's a little bit of a culprit with that, isn't it? Because we start snapping pictures of everything we're doing and can be a little bit tricky. Um, so then the next verse talks, how to deal with people in general, how to please them. <laughs> it's, um, it's an interesting verse. Having understood the mentality of people very carefully and knowing what makes each one happy, one who is skilled in propitiating people need to learn how to read again, uh, should have behave favourably with each person in that particular manner. What this is basically saying is, um, depending on the person's mentality, you would speak to them on that level and connect with them on that. Um, so don't, don't go to extremes and start talking really high about things that you know that they won't understand. Firstly, it's not very fair on them, I think, because it's almost like you're trying to show something. Um, and secondly, what's the point? What's the point in just giving out information? A conversation is meant to be an exchange. Um, and also think about um, how you speak to people that perhaps I don't want to use the word higher, that's not the right word, but maybe more advanced in certain areas than you. Like, for example, when I speak to my spiritual teachers, I always catch myself and think, hang on a minute, like I, I really want to treat them with respect and be careful and selective with what I say to them because it, you almost have that reverence for that level of person um, or elders as well. We should be careful in the way we use our speech with elders because even though I wouldn't say they're higher than us, it's, um, uh, it's it comes out of respect, I think. It's, it's If anyone can help in explaining that, I don't know where, yeah, how I explain that, but respect is the best word I could say. Um, the next verse talks about the golden mean, um, balancing the senses, making sure your activities are not too much or too little. So the golden mean is basically doing everything in moderation. So going about your day, not doing too much, not being extreme, finding the middle path of balance. Talks about hygiene, making sure that your hair is trimmed, your nails are trimmed, your feet are clean, and uh, making sure that you bathe daily, apply fragrances, be well dressed. Avoid dressing in an excessively flashy manner. It's interesting, isn't it? It says one must always wear jewels, mantras and medicinal herbs on the body. So in Vedic understanding, these things protect us astrologically when we have mantras and jewels. So that's probably why they've said to, to wear them. Um, but I think the one interesting here is to avoid dressing in an excessively flashy manner. Because what you don't want to do is attract people thinking about you too much and attracting attention. Yeah. Never need any excuse to enjoy the daily bath. Yeah, yeah. Well, some people skip baths. Like I've met people that don't bathe every day. And I thought, well, maybe it's normal. And then like, they kind of made me feel like I'm being a bit unecological by bathing every day and I thought no like I think you should bathe every day um so where was I uh da, 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 da. yes not attracting attention to yourself too much this is an interesting one to um to think about again it's just protecting your mind and your energy you don't want people kind of um being you don't want people being jealous of you it's not something that you want. So even though you might be trying to attract the attention, um, it's not good. It's not good. You, do, you don't want people... It's nice to obviously feel proud of yourself and show yourself in, in a positive way. But if it's too flashy and excessive to gain attention, this is not, not advisable according to the scriptures. 
Then it's got rules to be followed before going out at night. So it's quite funny actually, it's um, go out at night with a stick, it says. <laughs> Hopefully we don't need to do that now um, anymore, but uh, maybe now with the coronavirus we do need to go out with a stick <laughs> to keep the distance <laughs> from people. Um, and then wear a cap. Um, 11 items to avoid. So it's so, it's pretty random. I won't go into too much of this. Um, it, it, it's really interesting. If people are interested in this, this is where it starts talking about where you should touch um, certain items you should touch, certain things that you, should, you shouldn't walk over, um, about people's feet, about certain ways of, like things on the earth that you should avoid walking over. Uh, what else have we got? Avoid swimming across a river, it says here. Walking over ashes left behind after a bonfire. Boarding a doubtful boat. So to don't board any boats that you feel uncomfortable in. Um, avoid climbing a tree. And getting avoid getting into an improperly functioning vehicle. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, these things, obviously, you can tell they're written at a time when we didn't have these modern conveniences. Um, but it's, it's, all, it's all to do with protecting your energy. Uh, more things to avoid. Seven more items to avoid. Do not sneeze, laugh or yawn without covering your mouth. Gosh, I laugh all the time with my mouth wide open. <laughs> uh, avoid twisting the nose, it says. Avoid writing on the earth. That's interesting, isn't it? When we write on the sand on the beach, it says to avoid doing things like that without or awkwardly avoid awkwardly moving different parts of the body sitting for a prolonged time in squatting position so we don't need to worry about that because we've we've got chairs now and um but before that i think squatting was something that people did a lot uh and twisting the nose i think i do that quite a lot um but it basically, the twisting of the body parts leads to vata aggravation. So if you know Ayurveda, vata is a dosha that's easily thrown out of balance. It's all to do with too much movement. So twisting the body, moving too much, it aggravates the vata dosha. Uh, the next verse, when to stop activities, avoid things, places to stay, avoid places of talking about looking at the sun, dealing with alcohol, so much, honestly, there's so much to learn about how to just be and how to conduct your way through life. Avoid awkward body positions. Um, association with different types of people and five activities to avoid during Sandhya. So Sandhya is the transition between daylight and dusk, D daylight, uh, between sunrise and sunset, when the, when the sun is rising and when the sun is setting, so dawn and dusk, there we go, that's the Sandhya, and um, I think there are a couple throughout the day as well, I think there's one at midday, um, but the main ones are in the morning and the evening, it's like the twilight zone, and it's saying to avoid certain things during this time, one must avoid being dependent upon degraded, uncivilized, and over smart people. One should not quarrel with those who are civilized. One should avoid eating, having intercourse, sleeping, studying, and thinking about important matters during the transition periods of the day. That's really interesting, isn't it? Um, so it's basically during this time of the day where there's a transition of energy. In the yoga philosophy, this is where the sushumna nadi opens, where your kundalini is able to rise up. So that's why you can do some meditation or breathing practices in the sandhyas, which would be very effective. Just having a check of the time. Um, but it's just be, be wary to avoid certain activities. Do not accept food 
um, from public places and crowded places and do not accept food with prostitutes just to just to make sure we're aware of that um, do not accept food from wanderers and business-minded people avoid activities causing excessive vibrations to the hands and the hair and avoid <laughs> this is quite funny this one avoid making sounds using the body um, I don't think this means farting it's more to do with uh, your mouth your nails or like tapping your leg so any kind of agitated movement is advised to avoid and also accepting food from places uh, that are not from home like generally Ayurveda would say outside food should be avoided because you don't know who's really cooking it so the energy goes into that food and that's why they would say to avoid it um, and to be very be very wary of who you accept food from um, we've got more things to avoid um, won't go into see there's so many things that it tells you what to do I've cornered this this bit because it's really lovely so now in this part of the chapter it talks about how to use the world as a teacher the world itself is the teacher in all activities for one who is intelligent. Therefore, in all practical matters, such a person should follow the generally accepted societal norms by keenly observing them carefully. So what this is teaching us is that we can learn a lot from just having a general awareness of life. And it says nicely here, Ayurveda is more caught than taught. I love that. I absolutely love that. It's like Ayurveda, the knowledge of Ayurveda is already there. It's all there. As soon as we wake up, whatever we're doing, the knowledge is all there. It's whether you can catch it. It's whether your awareness is there to catch it. It's not about learning the strict rules, having your routine super listed and ticking everything off. It's more about having the awareness to, to be the observer of yourself and of life. Watch the way things are moving, happening. Watch the way water moves. Watch the way fire moves. Watch the way the trees move in the wind the way flowers grow, the way things digest in yourself, this observation of nature can be the biggest teacher. It says here, he does not have to be told each and everything. You should be able to start to see things. So I think when we try to gather too much knowledge from the outside, it is because we're very externally orientated we're always reaching out for the answer. We need someone to tell us how to be healthy. We need someone to tell us what to do. How do I do this? Yes, it's very good to have guidance, but you've got to balance that with an inner strength too of being brave to try something yourself or, or learn internally. This is lovely that I'd just like to say in light of that. Uh, everything is already present in the creation. As it is written in the book of, I don't, I've never heard of this, Coelet, the thing that has been, it is that which shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. So that's some, some little bit of poetry you can think about. It's up to us what we want to take, good or bad. Many lessons can be learned simply by carefully observing nature. For one who is intelligent, the whole world is a teacher. 
I love that so much. I really, really love that. Um, and then the last part goes into the definition of what good behaviour is, which in Ayurveda is called sadhvriti. Um, a heart melting with compassion, detachment by giving charity, control over the body, words and mind, and considering other people's needs as one's own are the essential aspects of virtuous behaviour. So really, I mean, I feel personally what this is teaching us is to serve others by seeing yourself and seeing the divine within them. And if you can do this on a daily basis, if you can observe and have that awareness, you will learn so much already about life and especially what Ayurveda teaches us on a spiritual lifestyle level. And it's just so fascinating that so much of this is in the chapter two of the Ashtanga Hridayam, which is the same chapter that has the daily routine. So what we, um, we tend to do is we focus on the outwardly cleansing part of the body, again, externally motivated, and we forget that daily, like a daily routine, we can commit to balancing ourselves, observing who we speak to, how we speak, what we do with our time, how we're interacting with others, or how we use our energy. And this can play into leading us to have a balanced mind so that we can fulfill, fulfill our dharma with a healthy body for as long as possible. So keep your mind clean as well as your body. And uh, this isn't something, I, personally, I don't think it happens overnight, especially not with me, I'm still learning. Um, and it's a long process, it's a long journey, so don't feel like, oh, you know, it's for these people that have reached perfection. It's not. It's there to teach us how to gain more awareness, and you start looking at your downfalls first, and it's okay. Like, it's okay to, to see yourself as being a little bit this and that, and noticing how you do things that maybe could be corrected. It's, there's always a chance to work on those, on those things. So we're coming to the end now. We've got about five minutes left before I clock off. Um, so yeah, someone put the link of my classes on there. Uh, if you're interested in joining me for those, please do. I'd love to have you in the group. Uh, it's every morning, so it's quite early in the morning. So those that get up early and fancy a little dose of Ayurveda, uh, I, I offer these sessions. And also I do pranayam and um, meditation. It's a lovely little community that's building. I always make sure that my classes are like that. I like to interact with them and go on the journey together. I also, um, excuse me, been talking way too much lately. I think I can really feel my throat becoming quite strained. Uh, I also do consultations as well. So if you're interested in having an Ayurvedic consultation online, I'm happy to chat through any imbalances that you're experiencing. So I think I'll leave it there for now. Um, thank you, Morley, for having me for this session. It's been absolutely wonderful. Um, I met Anita one or two years ago now, and uh, it was a really lovely experience. She's a wonderful woman. Uh, so thank you so much. And uh, the story is going to be available for, I think it's 24 hours, isn't it, on here? Great. Okay, so please be in touch, anybody that's interested in using my services. Otherwise, uh, enjoy Morley. And uh, lots of love to all of you that's listened. I hope you found it interesting and maybe see you again. So take care and goodbye.